Okay, good morning. Welcome to the sanctuary and happy Mother's Day. You know, I'm probably the most blessed person in this room because my mom is 96 years old and she is still with us. And I tell you, I hope she makes it to the luncheon. I'm so blessed to have her. Not only because she was with me, she's still with me, but she was an amazing mother to me. I mean, I am blessed that she raised me and by her example, I am who I am. And I want to tell you a few things she taught me. She taught me to love God. She was always seeking God. She was always going to Bible studies, prayer meetings. She just wanted more of God. She was desperate for God. But she taught me how to be faithful to family and friends. And she taught me to have concern for the poor because she came from some poverty. Her family had it rough back in the Depression. And her mother, my grandmother, with eight children to support and a wayward husband, would have a pot of soup available ready for anyone who came to the house to eat. So my mother learned from her mother to care for the poor. And because of my mother, I saw her take food to the shut-ins. She took care, she had a concern for the poor. And I, you learn by example, ladies. We need to be a good example for our children. She taught us to be generous in our giving. My mother loves to carry money around to give away. My mother's never had much. But she's generous, and she taught me that by example. She also taught me to be, because of the poverty and the things she'd lived through, she taught me to be grateful for the little things. She always said, if you just have one pair of shoes, be thankful that you have feet. There was a time I only had one pair of shoes, and they were sandals, and they cold on your feet in the wintertime. So, you know, my mom taught me never to take anything for granted. You know, by her example, I learned how to take care of my husband and my family. My mother waited on my dad, hand and foot. She taught me how to be hospitable, that my home would be open to everyone like her home was. Always open and ready to feed anyone. Because, you know, you're Italian, you're Spanish, you got to feed your people all the time. But anyway, she taught me to enjoy life to the fullest. Our house was full of music and dancing. We would have music and we would dance and do the limbo and, and the hoppy scoppy things that we used to crazy do all over the place. Well, it, we had no reason to do it. It was no big celebration. We just lived that life. We weren't stuck with this thing in our hands called social media. But our humble house was filled with love. And uh, she taught me to forgive and to pray for people who hurt my feelings Learned that lesson early in life. And she taught me never to judge anyone. She would say, Connie, never talk bad about somebody when you see them fall. Because there but by the grace of God go I. And it's a true statement. So I've learned to be merciful and not judgmental. She also told me, taught me how to respect those in authority. She carried a switch. <laughs> she also taught me how to manage money. My mom Knew how to manage money. I'm telling you, she could squeeze blood out of a turnip. We lived on a very meager budget, but we never went without the necessities of life. And you know, basically she taught me the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom of God. Because she lived them in her own life. Even before she was a born again child of God, she lived the keys to the kingdom. I could give you a litany of lessons that my mother taught me. After taking care of us, but I can uh, tell you this, that every mother, no matter how, maybe they, you didn't have the mother I had, but every mother who sacrificed her nights of sleep and taking care of us and making sure we were fed and clothed before she was, that mother is to be praised. Amen? We all need to give thanks to our, for our mothers and forgive them for where they failed us. But, you know, <clears throat> I'm sure you can say things like this about your parents, your mother in particular. And that's why God's word says in Proverbs 1, 8 through 9, listen, children, listen, children, you hear me? Listen to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Because they are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. These represent things, a, a garland around your head and a chain around your neck is, a, 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 is victorious, a victorious life. 
So uh, I want to bless the children right now and pray for them as they leave their for their classes, okay? Lord, without children, we wouldn't have mothers. We just thank you for these precious blessings that you've placed under our care for a season. Help us, Lord, to raise them up, not to be independent, but to be dependent upon you, Lord God. For you are our only hope and our future. Lord, as they go to their class, I pray that your anointing would be upon their teachers and that these children, their hearts would be open to the truth of your word, that it would dispel all darkness and deception, and that you would cause their hearts to bear much fruit for your kingdom. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now you can go to class. <laughs> Well, for, for several weeks, we've been um, learning about our inheritance. You all, we are rich. All of us are getting an inheritance. And it is called the kingdom of God. This is our hope. It's our future. And uh, we are joint heirs with Jesus. He is the firstborn son. So he gets a double portion, but we're joint heirs with him. He gets to sit on the throne and we get to sit on little, little thrones. <laughs> we're the little kings. That's the, the kingdom of God. It belongs to us. Jesus is our king. He is our lawgiver and he is our judge. And last week we began to study, we began a study on the kingdom of, of the kingdom of God. It's economy, the kingdom economy. And uh, we learned that as we place our trust in God, who is Jehovah Jireh, which means God, our provider, we walk in the supernatural provision that comes from obedient faith. I don't want to walk in the natural provision. Do you? Natural's not good. I want to walk in the supernatural provision of God. And it's available to everyone who places their trust in God. We just sang two songs all about the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. That means he'll honor his word. He is faithful. He can be trusted. You can trust him because he is faithful. Hallelujah. And when we place our trust in him who is faithful, then we will begin to act on that by being generous, being hilarious givers. And uh, so as everyone reaps what they've sown, well, those who are generous reap a generous harvest. Amen. And that is a financial wealth that God can use to meet the needs of other people. Hallelujah. So if you were not here for these teachings in the past few weeks, please go to our YouTube channel, which is called Sanctuary Church of Jacksonville and watch them. And uh, in addition, please like them and then share them. And then subscribe to our channel and then get the word out because God's kingdom, that's what we're teaching on and that's what we're called to preach, the kingdom of God. Now, because today, because a vast majority of professing Christians still live with the financial mindset of the world, we're going to look deeper into the word of God to see why we can trust God to be our provider in every single area of our lives, especially in the area of finances. Let's start with these three words. Money. Fear. Greed. Three nasty words. These barriers to financial freedom are the reason why so many so-called Christians live under the oppression of mammon. Ma what is mammon? You might not know. You could look it up in the, you go, Google it. You don't have to look it in a dictionary, just Google it. It's a demonic spirit that controls the mind of man. That's what mammon really is when you get right down to it. Mammon is a demonic spirit that controls the mind, the mind of man. It is tied to pride and the spirit of independence. Whew. So when you're proud, arrogant, independent of God, you have the spirit of mammon. It is like two sides of the same coin. So what can tear down these barriers to financial freedom? Only God's word. Why? Because his word reveals the character of God. We know God's character, what he is like, 
by seeing how he interacted, interacted or responded to people who looked to him for their needs. That's how we can know what God's character is like. Can he be trusted to meet our needs? Amen. So look at, we're going to, we can all, okay, so we can all agree that food and uh, air, oxygen, but food, water, and, and uh, th these are not luxuries or wants, food and water and air. They're not luxuries. They're, 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 they're necessities of life. We can all agree on that, right? Because we know that you can live approximately two to four minutes without oxygen, and then you'll die. We also know that um, you can go three to four days without water, and then you'll die. We also can die of starvation after a few weeks with no food. Now, you might not die right away, but your vital organs are beginning to shut down and you are in the process of dying. So we know that these are needs. We also need clothing to protect us from the elements, to keep us from the sun scorching and baking us. Ask Dwight, he knows all about that. Uh, we need clothing to keep us from freezing to death if you live up north because people freeze to death without clothing. So God knows that we need these things. And that's why he said in Matthew 6, 31, verse 30, 31 to, 6, 31 to 33, he says, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But instead, seek First, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So to put this plainly, we must not be like the Israelites, okay? The book of Exodus tells us what they were like. We can look that up. They had seen the mighty works of God when he sent ten, pl ten plagues to utterly destroy, annihilate the Egyptians. They were the most powerful nation on earth at the time. The Israelites had crossed the Red Sea, which is a massive body of water on dry land. And with their own eyes, they saw the Egyptians, their army swallowed up in the Red Sea with all of their chariots and horses. A massive army had come against them and God swallowed them up in the, in the, in the Red Sea. They saw that with their own eyes. And then they saw and experienced God's power and deliverance after over 400 years of slavery. Without, a, without an arrow or a, or a sword, the entire nation of the Israelites walked out of Egypt as free men and free women. And, and they carried with them the treasures of heaven. They were poor, and all of a sudden they were rich. They had all the clothing, all the gold, all the silver, everything. Man, those people couldn't wait to get them out of town. Just push them out the door because they're going to all be dead if they don't leave. So, you know, these people, the Israelites, they had walked out and God did it all. God did it all. But when they found themselves in the desert, they freaked out. What were they going to eat? What were they going to drink? Well, we can see in Exodus 16, 1 through 3. It says the whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, the desert. <clears throat> On the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out here into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Exodus 16 picks up in verse 11 through 20. It says, the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them. At twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Excuse me. You just saw me do all those. I'm telling you, God is patient. God is patient. And I believe you're going to do it again. We sing that song. 
Well, these people needed that song because I I just would not have much patience with them after everything they had seen. And now they're grumbling and grumbling and complaining. Said, I want to die in Egypt. Why'd you take us out here? Good grief. So God says, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight, you will eat meat. And in the morning, you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. You know what? God gives us what we need. Sometimes we don't like it in the form that he gives us. But he will always give us exactly what we need. In this case, they needed something to eat. They needed bread in the morning. And he says, "Uh, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded It is a command, not a suggestion. He says, everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it out by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then the Lord, then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. Any leftovers? No leftovers for tomorrow. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Have you ever seen maggots? Man. Ah, they are gross. Ugh. Creepy, crawly things, they're disgusting. What motivated these people to disobey the direct command of God given by Moses? Fear. Fear that there wouldn't be any more manna in the morning. So we hold on to what we have because we're afraid we won't have any of it tomorrow. And that's why Jesus said, not in the notes, this is free. How did he teach us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, that Father, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Let thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Are we trusting him for our daily bread? And he's talking about real bread, the kind you eat. Amen? Fear. Fear is the problem. Fear that there wouldn't be any more manna in the morning. And you know what? It's tied to the spirit of mammon. And mammon brings maggots. It's gross. Exodus 16, 21 to 27 goes on and it says, each morning everyone gathered as much as they needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. Just melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much. Two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, to the leaders, he said, this is what the Lord commanded. So the leaders of the community are out there and they see everybody gathering enough manna for two days. It's the sixth day. And, And they're coming to report this to Moses and Moses. Yeah, yeah, I I get it because you know why he said, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil, save whatever is left and keep it until morning. Whoa. Well, won't it end up with maggots? Nope. Because it's God's supernatural provision. Because he's trying to teach these people who had labored seven days a week just to stay alive. That you don't have to do that anymore. Because I'm providing for you. You don't have to burn the candle at both ends. You don't have to work five jobs. Because I'm going to provide for you. If you will trust me. 
Well, so they saved it until morning as Moses commanded and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any manna. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. There you go again. Disobedience. You know, because fear will always cause you to disobey God's commands. The Israelites had lived in the midst of Egypt's idolatry for generations. Think of how many generations is 400 years. Our nation has not been a nation for that long. That's a long time that the Israelites were in Egypt. They had become idol worshipers themselves. Remember the golden calf that they had built in the desert? After centuries of slavery, they had given up on God Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his promises. They had given up. I'm sure they're saying, well, where is this land of promise, this land flowing with milk and honey that was promised to us? Where was God when our babies were thrown into the Nile to be eaten by crocodiles? Where was God when they were working under the heavy hand seven days a week? Seven days a week, no rights, just work under the heavy hand of the Egyptians. So even though they had seen the miraculous power of God, they still did not trust him to take care of their daily needs in the midst of dire circumstances. They were in a dire circumstances. You're in the middle of a desert. There's no food. There's no water. You got air. And so... You know, even though they had seen all this miraculous power, they still didn't trust God. Why? Because they still had the mindset of an idolatrous nation and slavery where they had to work for every morsel of food they put in their mouth. Exodus 16, 28 through 35 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. You're to rest. So the people rested on the seventh day. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and toasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded take an omer of manna and keep it for generations to come so that they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt so Moses said to Aaron take a jar and put an omer of manna in it then place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come as the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law so that it might be preserved. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. So God provided bread and meat for over 2.5 million people, maybe 3 million, maybe more. We only know that they had 600 fighting men 600,000 fighting men over the age of 20 when they did the census. So we can assume there was something over two and a half million people that God provided bread and meat for, for every single day, the entire nation of Israel, every single day for 40 years. Do the math. Every single day he gave them their daily bread for over 14,600 days. God is faithful. He did it without fail. And in spite of their fear and disobedience, he was a faithful father to his children. He also provided water for them and their flocks and herds. That's found in Exodus 17, 1 through 6. It says the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. 
They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. You know, it's funny. If I was Moses, I'd say, where, where am I supposed to get water for you guys? Lord, help me. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I going to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with, the, with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you at the, by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. So God, you know, God, he causes water to come out of a rock. Not the ground, which could be rocky, but a rock. It's, it, it was supernatural. See, this is the supernatural provision of God. Amen? What this shows is how God was so patient, even with his rebellious children. He even provided clothing for them during their 40 years of wandering in the desert. Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 4 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness. Folks, put yourself in the context of this scripture because when we come out of Egypt, our, the, the world, we're going to be put in conditions that we must, that God tests us to see if we will be obedient to him. So he says, in order to humble and test you, we have to be humbled. We come into the kingdom of God. We've been living in a world system that venerates pride and arrogance and self-sufficiency. And I can do it. Whatever you put your mind to, you can do it. And you know what? It's a big fat lie. There's a lot of things that are beyond your control. Huh. So God has to humble us. And he said whether or not you would keep his commands. In every single test, it's a test to see if we'll pass the test. And, and you pass the test when you do whatever God tells you to do, even when it's the absolute opposite that the world tells you to do. So he says, he humbled you, God did this, Israelites, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna. Which neither you nor your ancestor had ever known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. 40 years their clothes didn't wear out. Have you ever, you know what? I had a pair of shoes. I loved them and I bought every color they had. But you know what? I forgot I had them. They were in these boxes up in my shelf. And I remembered them after a couple of years. I literally took those shoes out of the box and they fell apart. Because things wear out. They corrode. But they were in the desert for 40 years and their clothes did not wear out. This, this is incredible. God caused the Israelites to hunger so that they would be forced to rely on God's supernatural provision. God does that for us too, people. This is how God works in our lives. He, wants, he puts us in a place where we are tested to see if we will be obedient to his word. And when we are, then he gives us, he meets our need According to his great riches and glory in Christ Jesus, it's always supernatural. It's never what you thought it was going to be. It never comes from where you thought it would come from. You just get in a hopeless situation. You turn to God. He says, do this. You do it. And it all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's the provision. And he gets the glory and honor. You know, 
he, it's quite natural for us to believe that we can take care of ourselves without God's help. We're born with that. We are born with it. Ask the mother of a two-year-old. That's our nature. It's the human nature. I can do it myself. And it's called the pride of life. So God puts the Israelites in dire situations so that they can see his power and his love and concern for them. And he does exactly the same thing for you and me. So have you ever found yourself in dire circumstances? I have. All the time. Because God disciplines those whom he loves. It's in our dire circumstances that God shows up and shows off. And it's usually at the last moment. Amen, Dwight? Good Lord. I know, right? And it's always like at the last minute. But throughout the centuries, God continued. This wasn't just the Israelites. I want to show you that this didn't just happen to the Israelites. It happened throughout history. Throughout the centuries, God continued to show himself merciful on behalf of those who place their trust in him. The Bible shows us that God is capable and willing to provide for us in miraculous ways. He does not get glory when we do it ourselves. He does not get glory when it's natural. He only gets glory when it's supernatural. You don't have a testimony till you've been tested. And your testimony is, look what God did for me. Hallelujah. I was in destitute, desperate situation. This is what God did. He gets the glory. Amen? Amen. That's what this is all about. Just look at Elijah. Let's talk about Elijah. He was an awesome guy. He had just come down from a real mountaintop experience. He was on Mount Carmel, Carmel, where he had confronted the prophets of Baal, if you remember the story. And after God showed up and God showed off, Elijah kills all the 400 prophets of Baal. Man, and then he fled for his life because the queen Jezebel was after him and she wanted him dead. And by the way, there's now a famine in the land. So you got the whole army coming against you, running around looking for you because they want you dead because of what you did. And, you know, God, I was only doing what you wanted me to do. Lord, look it. I even killed all these prophets, you know, and there's a famine in the land. Where am I going to get food and water? You know, I don't know what was going through his mind. There wasn't going to be rain for three years. I'd call that dire circumstances. In 1 Kings 17, verse 2 through 16, it tells us what happened. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here. Okay. Turn eastward and hide. Okay, I'm going to hide. Got an army coming after me. I'm going to hide. He tells him where to hide. Hide in the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook. And I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kirith, Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. The ravens, birds, Brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. So God provides for him supernaturally. There's nothing natural about ravens bringing you food. They like to take food and eat it themselves. Amen. So sometime later the brook dries up because there's a famine in the land. There had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And stay there. And this is a foreign country. Okay, this is not Israel. He's being sent out of the country. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he goes, he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me please a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to start a fire to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. 
fear. Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel. Remember, she's not an Israelite. She's a foreigner. The God of Israel. This is what the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the, jar, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. Why? Because she believed him. She believed the word of the Lord that came through Elijah. Otherwise, she wouldn't have done it. You see, if we're going to walk in the supernatural provision of God, we've got to believe the word of the Lord. Not just here. It's got to be here. We've got to act on it. If you don't act upon the word, you really don't believe it. You don't. It's not real for you. But it was for this lady. This guy's come into town. He's a prophet from Israel. He says that the God of Israel is going to make sure she doesn't starve to death. So, yeah, she can take that little bit of oil and, and flour and make a little loaf of bread. I don't care if it was a morsel. If she obeyed God, God was going to do supernatural, something supernatural, and it was going to save her life and the life of her child. So she did it. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every single day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. So God provided food for Elijah from the most unlikely source, a woman, a widow, and she wasn't even an Israelite. Whom he finds preparing her last meal, her last supper before dying. You know, Elijah was a man of faith. God had told him that a widow would provide food for him. If you go back and read the scripture, the exact words. A widow will provide food for you. And because of his faith and obedience, and you will not obey God without faith. Because of his faith and obedience. Same, two sides of the same coin. Both he and the widow were fed until the end of the famine. Here's the deal. Our obedience always leads to blessing for ourselves and for other people. Always. Amen. If it's all about you, it's, it's not right. Your obedience should result in a situation that will be a blessing to yourself and other people. Now, God also did it again in 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. Another widow. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. Elisha was the protege or the follower of Elijah. And Elisha traveled with him. He saw the miracles that God did, did through Elijah. Many, many miracles. And now he is the prophet of God. And it says the wife of a man from the company of the prophets. There were lots of prophets. Cried out to Elisha. Your servant, my husband is dead and you know that he revered the Lord but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves Elisha replied to her how can I help you tell me what do you have in your house your servant has nothing there at all she said except for a small jar of olive oil Elisha said go around Ask all of your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars. And as each is filled, put one aside. She left him. She did what he said. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not another a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Let me tell you, God is not a respecter of persons. He cares about every single detail in our lives. 
Nothing is trivial to him. You know, Jesus gladly turned water into wine for a wedding reception. This frivolous miracle is to reveal the Father's extravagant generosity for our ordinary wants and needs. There's a lot of needs going on around Jesus. People are sick. People are dying. There's lepers and prostitutes who need to be set free. Listen, but he took time, even though he didn't, I don't know, I can't explain it, but it is an obvious miracle that proves that he cares about every little detail of our lives. John 2, 1 through 11 tells it like this. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Maybe she was the wedding planner. I don't know. Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. But, her you know, isn't it something? Mothers know best. <laughs> she knows best. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some water out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet toast, tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants had known had, who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What did Jesus, what Jesus did here at Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So, you know, Jesus was not into cheap tricks. He performed miracles to, to reveal his glory, who he was and the character of God. Because he is our generous, Jesus is our generous, Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider and Matthew 17, 24 through 27 tells us this. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered, then the children are exempt. Jesus said to him, but so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch. Open its mouth and you will find a four drop my coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and for yours. Taxes to pay? No problem, because God meets all our needs. I have to tell you the story, and I'm sure most of you have already heard it, but for the sake of those who haven't, Dwight and I, at one point, we were on a cruise, and we went to St. Martin, where they sell diamonds. And I never had had a real nice wedding ring. And Dwight wanted to buy me this diamond. Well, if you put it in a setting, the ring then they charge tax on you. But if you don't put it in, if it's just a loose stone, they don't charge tax. But Dwight was afraid that if we didn't put it in the ring, we would lose it. And then we wouldn't have it insured and we would not, we wouldn't be, he said, I, I can't afford to buy you another one if something happens to this diamond. I didn't know how we could afford it to start with and I certainly didn't know how we were going to pay the taxes on it. So that morning, Dwight stood in line with Everybody else on a carnival ship back then, everybody had to go through customs. And uh, I went on to breakfast, and b but before I did, I'm praying. I'm saying, Lord, you know, everybody is buying this stuff, and they're not claiming it. They're not going to pay taxes. They're just pretending like they didn't buy anything. And, you know, Lord, we can't lie. We have to tell the truth. 
you know, and I don't even know how we're going to pay the tax. I said, but you know what? And here's the story that he reminded me of. He reminded me of this scripture that I just read to you. I said, okay. I'm assuming then that if we have to pay the tax, you'll somehow provide for that money to pay it. So Dwight's in line and he gets to the place and there's like four people or five people, you know, agents. And Dwight had written down the value of the diamond and, and he gives it to, finally, he's the last guy in line and he gives it to the <clears throat> agent and he said, she's, he, she, whatever. He says, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I think you uh, got too many zeros here. And he says, no, that's accurate. And he said, uh, well, it's, it's unset, right? And he says, no, I had it set in my wife's ring because I didn't want to take a chance of losing it. Because if I lose it, I can't afford to buy another one. He said, oh, wow. Hmm. He said, well, uh, you bought it in St. Thomas, right? And he, she, he said, no, no, because, you know, St. Thomas has got a higher limit that you don't have to pay tax on. And she, he said, no, I bought it in St. Martin. Are you sure you didn't say? No, no, I'm sorry. I bought it in St. Martin. He said, oh, God. Well, by this time, everybody else is finished. They're starting to come over and say, what's going on here? And this lady or man says, uh, uh, this man bought his wife a diamond and he's got it on his claim sheet and, and he bought it in St. Martin and, and then he had it set in a ring and said, I don't know what to do with this guy. He said, well, I, the other person says, well, I want to kiss him. Must have been a girl. And uh, this other people come over and finally the, and they're all talking about it because they don't know what to do because nobody ever tells the truth. And so finally the supervisor comes up. Here's a story, and he, she, whoever it was, said, well, I don't care what you say, Mr. Senak. This is an unset diamond, and he put zero tax on it. That's a testimony. It's a testimony, a test that we would tell the truth or lie, like everybody else did. It's a test. And God made provision. We didn't pay a penny of tax on that diamond. So, you know, we're never going to obey God until we trust his word. I thank God that I had read the Bible. I knew this scripture. I knew this story about the temple tax. If he can tell Peter to go out and catch a fish, it's going to have a four drop coin in it. God can do anything he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. And we have to trust him. He is faithful. Amen. So I want to tell you, we can trust God to meet all our needs because he said he would. He said he would. And it's always more than enough. And we know this from John 6 verse 1 through 13. It says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, and that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they had they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. They're all wanting a piece of the action. Then Jesus went up to the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. So there was a lot of travelers coming into Jerusalem for the festival. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. God knows what you need before you do. He's already got a plan for you. He's already got a plan. So he, Philip answered him, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for one, each person to have one bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small loaves of Barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and so they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. I don't know how many women and children, but probably mostly men. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all they had enough to eat. He said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the piece of the pieces of the five bar barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. It's always more than enough. Gee, God is not stingy. 
He did it again, this time for over 4,000 people found in Mark 8, 1 through 9. It says, during those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. This is supernatural provision. Even after seeing all these miracles of supernatural provision, the disciples still did not understand. And this is in Mark 8, 11 through 21. It says the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation keep asking for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed over to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf that they had with them in the boat. And this is really funny. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? And that's the question for us today. Do you still not understand? Do you really believe that Jesus is who he said he is? That he is our provider? He's our provider for salvation, for deliverance, for protection, for food, water, and clothing. He will meet every need that we have when we walk in obedient faith. More than food and water, though, he meets the deeper need for his righteousness, his presence, and his Holy Spirit. I'm going to be closing with this. Matthew 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus said in John 6, 48 and 49, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You know what? He's not only the bread of life. He is the fountain of life where living waters flow. John 4, 7 through 14, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his, also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. 
But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them, in them, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So Jesus is our provision for all things necessary for this life and the life to come, even clothing. Even clothing. Isaiah 61.10 says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. Amen. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So, knowing that all things, all needs are provided for us in Christ. Jesus tells us this, Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up. Do not, do not store up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The kingdom economy is always enough. It's always more than we need. It is the abundant life that Jesus promised to everyone who believes. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21 now to him who is able to do immeasurably, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. If the church took hold of these truths. And acted upon it. There would be no poverty. Our nation is under a curse. Our nation is under a curse. Because the church. Is filled with mammon. The love of money. Trusting in their money. In their wealth. We can repent as individuals. And we can cry out to God for mercy for our nation. Because we're the only ones who can do it. We're the only ones who have the word of God. We're the only ones who have the spirit of God. We're the only ones who have access to the kingdom economy. I'm grateful that so many of us in this church are true givers. In fact, I don't know, know a single person in this church that's not a giver. And it's a blessing to be a part of this body. I am so grateful. Let's pray. Lord, your word is rich. Your word is rich. It is rich. We thank you for the opportunity and the blessing of walking in your kingdom economy. Where all our needs are met according to your great riches in Christ Jesus. Your blessing over our lives, your abundant life, your abundance that you give us, God, is always enough. It's more than enough to help others. I pray, Lord, that this word would take root in our hearts and that we would become even more frivolous in our giving, that we would give without concern for what's going to be left tomorrow, that we would be like the widow Who kept pouring and pouring and pouring into the jars. For the woman who was willing to give the last of her food to the prophet of God. Lord, we want to be more, more like you. Because you are a generous God. You're so generous, Lord. We we just want to be like you. We repent of any trust that we've placed in money, in wealth, 
any trust that we put in this world system, God, uh, this world economy. Lord God, we repent. And we turn to you and we know, God, that you love us and you've proven it over and over again. We believe you'll do it again. You'll do it again and again and again. You'll do it 14,600 times if you have to. You'll do it every day. You will meet our needs no matter what happens in this collapsing economy, Lord God. You are our hope. You are our future. You are our provider. We turn to you. We look to you. We turn our face to you, oh God. We thank you, God, that you are our healer, our provider. God, you're everything we hope for, everything we imagine. God, you are more than enough. You are more than enough, Lord God. And we rejoice. We rejoice in the face of dire circumstances because it's just another opportunity for you to be glorified in our lives. Let your kingdom come. Let your power be displayed in our lives, oh God, as we obey you. We love you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Make your home at us, with us, oh God, and use us. To bring glory to your name, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If you need prayer, please come forward. We'll be happy to pray with you. And I'm going to go ahead and bless the food before we go into the beautiful preparations that our precious team has worked so hard to make happen. Um, Lord, we just thank you for the food that we're about to eat. We ask your blessing over it. We thank you for the hands that prepared it truly for Danny and her children and, her, and Mar Marina. God, for those who put their hands to do such work, God, to make it such a beautiful ex presentation. We just thank you for them. Bless them with strength. Fill them with your joy, which is the, the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. God, just fill them and bless them beyond words, God, for all that they've done on our behalf. We thank you for our mothers. Bless each and every one of them. And let this time be a true celebration of your goodness towards us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.